Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm not just real sure I'll be able to get through this morning. I am in the midst of one of the worst allergies, uh, allergy attacks that I have had literally in years. Uh, yesterday, I got outside, messed around just a tiny bit yesterday afternoon. I went into coughing spasms, uh, sneezing spasms that I could not control. I couldn't get it to stop. And <coughs> my goodness gracious, I've, I've taken this and I've taken that. Nothing seems to be really absolutely controlling it. And needless to say, I feel like an 18-wheel, you know, semi ran over me, backed up, and did it all over again. So uh, anyway, I do my very best uh, to try to get this done this morning. And again, I want to thank you so very, very much for, uh, for being with me. And by the way, those of you, I just want to thank you uh, for your response, your wonderful response to the introduction of my brand new book, The Death of Adam and the Life of Christ. Uh, I've already shipped off three boxes full of orders, uh, boxes this long, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the orders are still coming in. I appreciate that so very very much. It shows your interest in these things that are so very, very important. Now, pardon me, let me reiterate, I cannot give the special introductory offer to overseas orders. I, I wish that I could, but I simply cannot. You know, uh, it costs $18 to send a book like this, for instance, to Canada. It costs $25 to send one to Ethiopia. And so, uh, no, I can't extend this special offer. However, for those of you in, in the continental U.S., uh, the very special offer for the rest of September and all of October, the special introductory price of this book, it, it's regularly priced at $19.95 plus $4.95 shipping. Introductory offer, $17.95, postpaid total price. Uh, uh, there's a banner. On my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. Just go there, click on the link, and it will show you how to order. Uh, if you don't want to do that, contact me through email, and I'll give you the instructions on how to pay. All right? So, again, thank you so much for the wonderful response to this, uh, to this new book. I do appreciate it. Well, <coughs> we're looking at the subject at the Great Tribulation. Now, our dispensational friends tell us the Great Tribulation is something that is off in our future. After the rapture, after the man of sin signs a peace treaty with Israel allowing them to rebuild the temple, he then breaks that peace treaty and begins persecuting them in the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. That's called the Great Tribulation in the Dispensational Paradigm. Then there is a relatively new idea. <coughs> Pardon me. It is espoused by Gregory Beale. Uh, Gregory Beale, of course, is a fantastic scholar, uh, Greek scholar especially. But Gregory Beale takes the position that we are currently living in the time of the Great Tribulation. Now, that's absolutely amazing. Sam Frost has adopted that view as well. And perhaps, just perhaps, we'll have more to say about that as we continue. But I think that the things that I'm going to share with you today and tomorrow, especially, uh, will kind of put an end to that claim. Uh, it, it is absolutely, I mean, it's stunning that anyone would say that we are living in the time of the Great Tribulation, that the Great Tribulation is being experienced now. You know, that means that we are currently experiencing the greatest tribulation that the world has ever seen. Huh. That's amazing, isn't it? Well, anyway, I want you to know, I want, and I want you to see, that what Jesus is predicting here is taken right straight out of the Old Covenant. The law of Moses. I've already shared with you the Jewish narrative. That Jewish narrative was a, was a given timeline 
for the last days. And that great tribulation would give way to, and we will develop this even more, that great tribulation would give way to the coming of the Lord, the judgment, the resurrection, the new heaven and the new earth. Now, folks, that means that if we are in the time of the great tribulation, then the coming of the, of the Lord ought to be coming immediately. Or we ought to be able to determine when the current time is because Jesus said immediately after the tribulation, the day of the Lord would come. Are we supposed to believe that the greatest tribulation that the world has ever seen, ever, has continued for 2,000 years? Well, okay, getting ahead of myself again. So, what I want to share with you this morning is the fact that Jesus' prediction of the great tribulation is part and parcel of the Old Covenant testimony concerning the events of the last days. Now, I'm already, you know, six minutes or seven minutes into this, so I'm, I'm going to have to hurry here just a tiny bit. But I want, I want to go with you, and I want to take you uh, with, with me to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, and particularly for our focus here, Isaiah chapters 2 through 4. Isaiah chapters 2 through 4 is one united prophecy. Now, by the way, in my book, The Last Days Identified, I develop and discuss the unity of Isaiah chapters 2 through 4 and how the New Testament writers cite it, quote it, and allude to it over and over and over again and apply it to the days in which they were living. Not to some far off time, but to their day, their generation. Well, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and following says, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the tops of the mountains. Now, folks, this is the Messianic kingdom. It's the Messianic temple. Now, notice very quickly Isaiah chapter 2, 10 and following. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up. Now we'll go down to verse 19. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty when He arises to shake the earth mightily. Now, I want you to know something here. This language, you're running to the hills, hiding in the caves, and in the rocks of the mountains, is language that is taken directly from a time of warfare. This language is used in Judges, chapter 6, when Israel was invaded <clears throat> and the, by the Midianites. What did the citizens of Israel do? They ran to the hills. They hid in the rocks and the caves. This language is used in Chronicles. This is common language of the Old Covenant to speak of a time of war, a time of invasion, when an army would invade the land and defeat the military forces of the land, specifically in this case Israel, and the Israelites would flee to the mountains and hide in the rocks and the caves. Well, this is what, you know, this would happen in, quote, the last Days. Now, let me ask you a question. Robinson said some years ago in his book, The Coming of the Lord, if this is talking about the so-called earth-burning, time-ending day of the Lord, it would be a little bit difficult for people to run to the mountains. I mean, after all, that day of the Lord, the supposed future day of the Lord, is supposed to come and be over in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I mean, do you really seriously have time to run to the hills and hide in the caves if it's over that fast? See how ridiculous that is? And yet, this is the last day's day of the Lord. 
Well, we're told that we're living in the last days and the day of the Lord is the end of the current Christian age. Well, that must mean that this so-called yet future day of the Lord is not over in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, but rather it allows men to run to the mountains and hide in the caves. Wait a minute. How, what good would it do to hide in a cave? If every person on the globe is going to see him coming and stand before a literal tribunal. Once again, do you see how that does not work? Okay, so here we are, a prediction of the last days, day of the Lord. Well, in chapter 3, what do we find? Let's start reading with verse 25. Oh, we need to go back to verse 13. It is the time in which the Lord would stand up to judge his people. Now verse 25. Your men shall fall by the sword, your mighty men in the war. Her gates, that's Jerusalem's gates, shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit on the ground. This imagery of sitting on the ground is a time of mourning, a time of lament, a time of sadness and defeat. It's being in the dust. And by the way, in chapter 3, verse, <coughs> verse 1 and following, this is a time of famine. A time when there's no bread. A time when there's no water. Oh, well, wait a minute. This is the day of the Lord being described here. But do you see? It's a time when Israel's men would fall by the sword. In Luke 21, verse 24, in a passage that virtually everyone agrees refers to the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, Jesus cites, echoes this very verse. In other words, Jesus applies Isaiah's prediction of the last days, day of the Lord, when Israel's men would fall by the edge of the sword, Jesus applies it to what? A.D. 70. Now, notice this language here. It's the time of judgment on Israel. Now, does it say, well, then will be great tribulations such as has never been? No, it doesn't use the language, but it's most assuredly the time of judgment on Israel, which Jesus is predicting in Matthew chapter 24. Well, look, I, I'm, I'm already out of time for this morning's morning musings, so I'm going to cut it short right here. And I'll come back to Isaiah chapters 2 through 4, in tomorrow's video, to show you the New Testament application of, number one, the last days. Number two, of this time of when Israel's men would fall by the edge of the sword, when men would run to the mountains, hide in the caves, and say, fall on us, this time that Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 24, the time when they would pray that their flight, flight from where? Judea and Jerusalem, would not be on the Sabbath. That's a first century setting, a setting in Judea, just like Isaiah chapters 2 through 4. So, again, I'm going to have to cut this short right now. I'll pick it up tomorrow. I assure you, you do not want to miss this. In the meantime, hey, take advantage of the special introductory offer of my new book, The Death of Adam the life of Christ. One reviewer has said, I don't know how anyone can answer and refute this book. Take advantage of the special offer, donkpreston.com or bibleprophecy.com. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you on the flip side.